draws near and my time has come still my soul will see your praise Hey everyone, I'm Josh. And I'm Jessica. We're so glad that you're here. Before we get started, three quick things. First, we'd love for you to check in. You can do that on the Branch app. Second, if you came prepared to give, you can also do that on the Branch app. We also have giving boxes at the back of the room. And third, if you're wondering what's happening at the Branch, we have a button for that. It's called What's Happening. And you can find all of our upcoming events like the Grace and Truth Conference, LGBTQ+, and parenting in today's culture. We're excited to have Caleb Kaltenbach come and speak to us about how to be people of grace and truth. Register for that on the app. It's coming up this weekend, November 10th and 11th, so make sure and register today, and we'll see you there. And if you are new to the branch and you are looking for your first steps to getting involved, coming up next Sunday, we have Starting Point. This is an opportunity for you to learn a little bit about who we are and hear about all the different ways that you can get involved here at the branch. So November 12th, join us during second service for Starting Point. You can pull up the app and register for Starting Point today. And our fall season of Rooted is coming to a close. And if you don't know what Rooted is, you need to ask around. It is already changing so many lives here at the branch. And lucky for you, there's another one coming in January. So you can register for that today. We had some people asking about it that weren't able to do it this fall. And so registration is open for the winter season of Rooted. So go to the app and register for that today. You're not gonna wanna miss this opportunity. And we are continuing our Flesh and Bone series today. So you can go ahead and be pulling up the Branch app to find the sermon notes for this week's message. Again, we are so glad that you are here with us. Welcome to the Branch. Jesus has to be coming soon because the Texas Rangers have won the World Series. And Ryan Rainey said, you know it, amen. Oh, I'm so happy for him as well as all of our long-suffering Ranger fans in light of what's happened this past week. If you are driving down the road listening to this message, uh, you're not able to watch online 
I just want you to know that everybody I'm looking at looks like they're living in the twilight zone right now in light of the Rangers, like they've entered into an alternative universe, and yet this is very much reality. So if you're with us for the first time, we spent some time this summer in a series called Flesh and Bone, in which we were exploring what Scripture has to say about matters related to our bodies. We took a break from it for a couple of months, did another series called This Is Us, basically on what it means to be a church, a community of people following Jesus. And I'm coming back around to do a couple of more things in the Flesh and Bone series uh, before I walk away from it for a while. These are a couple things I didn't get to. One of them was sickness and suffering and healing, which we looked at last week. And this week, I'm going to circle back around to the matter of gender with you. Uh, Recently, I've been pondering the differences between men and women uh, in ways that go beyond just our bodies. Uh, For instance, uh, when it comes to money, uh, a man, and I do this, a man will pay $2 for a $1 item that he needs. And a woman will pay $1 for a $2 item that she doesn't need, but she found on sale. <laughs> this is true in our marriage now. When it comes to bathrooms, for a man, he only has on average seven items. In his bathroom, you know, a toothbrush, toothpaste, maybe a little hair product, some shaving cream. About on average, you have only about seven products as a man uh, in your bathroom. Women average around 327 (laughs) products. And a man is only able to identify about 12 of the 327 products. When it comes to arguments, a woman has the last word in any argument. And any man uh, that says something after that last word is really just starting a new argument. Uh, So I'm returning to the subject of gender one more time in our series before I close it, only in a much different way than some of the things we were dealing with this summer. I want to address a question that has often come up as it relates to the feminine gender in the life of the church. I've probably had just as many men ask me this question as women about two particular passages in our New Testaments which rise to some people's consciousness when we think about this matter of feminine gender operating in life and ministry and proclamation in the life of the church. I'm speaking of two passages that Paul writes which prohibit women speaking to the church or having a position of leadership in the church. And I'm glad these questions have been asked over my time here because it shows that people are taking scripture seriously. Before I get to these passages, I want, though, to orient us a little bit in the difference that Jesus has made for women in our world. Jesus brought the dignity of women to light when much of the world was still in the dark. When he was born, the Roman Empire ruled the civilized world. And the Roman Empire required by law for a father to raise every healthy male child. But a father only had to raise the firstborn female. The other children born female could be discarded or left to fend for themselves. In ancient Athens, girls received little to no education. In ancient Roman, Greek, and much of Jewish culture, A woman's identity was tied to what man she was married to and to whether or not she bore children. Today, we still use language from the ancient world, even in modern American culture. We use language like giving her hand in marriage. That came right out of Greco-Roman times when a father was giving his daughter away to be married. Whoever had her hand 
got to determine her religion and which gods she worshiped. This was the world that Jesus came into. This was the world that Jesus spoke into. And knowing this can help you appreciate all the more some of the stories that you read of Jesus engaging with women in the Gospels. Just to remind you of a few, in John chapter four, Jesus strikes up a conversation with a a woman beside a well in Samaria while waiting to meet up with his disciples. And it becomes the longest recorded conversation Jesus has with a person in all four of the Gospels. It's with a woman. And John tells us then, in the middle of the conversation, John 4, 27, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. Jesus' own disciples were. Why? Because Jewish rabbis didn't do this, particularly with a Samaritan woman who has had five husbands. And the dude she is connected to then that she shacked up with, she's not married to, as the story reveals. But Jesus does. She winds up going back home and shares the story of her encounter with Jesus. And in John 4, 39, we read this powerful verse. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Luke 8 tells us another story of an entourage of women who traveled with Jesus, or they followed Jesus and his disciples around. They had either been delivered from demonic oppression or healed of something by Jesus. This is Luke 8, 1 through 3. It would be shocking for a rabbi to allow women to be seen with him like that, even if they were supporting his work financially. But this rabbi does. In Jesus' day, women didn't travel, even in the entourage of rabbis, And they were often encouraged to remain indoors. In Greco-Roman culture even, plays in public theater were populated by prostitutes and slave girls because respected women and, and, and unmarried girls were encouraged to stay indoors and out of sight. In Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, you read a story about two sisters, Martha and Mary, who are hosting Jesus for a meal. And Luke says that Martha is distracted by all the preparations that have to be made while her sister Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to what he said. And so Martha asks Jesus to tell Mary to help her. Maybe you've done that before. When you say, Lord, tell so-and-so to help me. (laughs) She says, will you tell Mary to come in here and help me? And Jesus says this in Luke 10, verse 41. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, of course, this story has something to say about how often we can be busy for Jesus at the expense of spending time with Jesus. But there's also something else going on here. The phrase sitting at at Jesus' feet that's earlier in the passage was a term used to describe a person who was someone else's disciple. Rabbis had disciples that sat at their feet. A question you might ask a Jewish young man is, is whose feet do you sit at? Who is your rabbi? Here is a woman, though, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And this is uncommon. Because rabbis just had their disciples sitting at their feet, and all their disciples were male. Mary was doing in Jewish culture what only a man could do. And Jesus says, Mary chose better. And when he said this, he was making it clear that he was inviting women to be his disciples as well. They could sit at his feet, a radical thing in that culture. In Luke chapter 11, one chapter later, Verses 27 and 28, we read this exchange. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. And he replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. 
Now, I'll tell you the radicality of this exchange. In the ancient world, a woman's highest calling, other than to be married, was to have children. What could be greater than being Jesus' mother? In fact, this person is trying to bless Jesus and his mom as he's teaching. What could be better? Blessed is the one who gave you birth. Blessed is the one who nursed you. What could be greater than that? I love what one scholar said about this exchange. He said, you would expect a polite response from Jesus, like, thank you, my mom's the best ever. She was a virgin, you know. (laughs) Instead, Jesus gives this rather sharp response and said, blessed are those, rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And it's as though Jesus is challenging the notion of what is the most blessed thing. There is a more blessed thing than to give birth to me and nurse me. The most blessed thing is to hear the word of God and obey it. It's as though he's redefining the highest calling of a female. And that as much of a blessing as it may be to have children, a woman's greatest blessedness is hearing the word of God and obeying it. The story continues in the Gospels. In John chapter 20, it's a woman who is the first person to encounter the resurrected Jesus. In all four of the Gospels, it's women that Jesus sends the very first uh, sins as the very first people to declare the news of his resurrection. And yes, I am aware that Jesus' first 12 he called, his 12 apostles, were all male. But the problem was they were all hiding on Resurrection Sunday. And the first one to encounter Jesus was a woman in his resurrected state. The first people that Jesus sends out to declare the news that he is risen are women in the Gospels to his 12 male apostles in hiding. Acts 2 tells the story of the day the church was born in Jerusalem when the Spirit is poured out upon those believers in that upper room at the beginning of Acts chapter 2 and you find a crowd gathering, marveling at what they're hearing from these believers and you find Peter standing up and preaching, trying to explain what it was the city of Jerusalem was witnessing at the moment and Peter pulls out his Bible, so to speak, and points him to the prophet Joel and says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, verse 16. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit on those days and they will prophesy. Twice it's mentioned, the spirit being poured out on women and not just men, and twice it's mentioned that they will prophesy. They will speak words of the Lord What is also significant here is Peter speaking about the Spirit being poured out on all God's people and not just a select few. You go on later in Acts, the church is mentioned as meeting at Mary's house in Acts chapter 12. It's planted in Philippi out of Lydia's house in Acts chapter 16. She's the first convert in the whole city of of, of Philippi that we know of. The church meets in her house. We read in Acts 21 about the evangelist Philip, a deacon from Acts chapter 6 who becomes evangelist. By the way, this isn't even in my notes, but I just feel like I want to tell you this. You need to be prepared for more, one, more than one season in your life because Philip, who's a deacon in Acts chapter 6 trying to solve a problem of injustice in the church in Acts chapter 6, becomes later an evangelist in the later part of Acts. And then he has not one, not two, not three. He has four daughters who all become prophetesses, Acts chapter 21. There's a woman named Phoebe who is the first person Paul recognizes at the closing of his letter to the Romans in Romans chapter 16. The first person he recognizes at the end of his letter is this woman named Phoebe. Romans 16, 1 and 2, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sincrea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. You see a few things here. One is, you see that she serves as a deacon in the church in Sincrea. 
Secondly, he commends her so that the believers in Rome will accept her. Why? Because she's the one delivering the letter. She's the one delivering the letter to the Romans. And in fact, it was customary for the one delivering the letter to actually read the letter aloud to the community. And the ancient scholars will tell you and also answer questions about the letter. This he entrusts to Phoebe. Go down six more verses in Romans chapter 16 and verse 7. Paul says, greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who've been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles and they were in Christ before I was. Paul recognizes a couple here, Andronicus and Junia, outstanding among the apostles. First of all, you're like, wait a second, I thought there were 12. Andronicus and Junia weren't in the list in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Oh, that's why it's important to read your Bible. Andronicus and Junia are apostles. By the way, even one more thing than that, Junia is a feminine name. You say, are these, do these have the same authority as the 12? I would say not. Apostle means one who is sent. It's another word for missionary going to a place where the gospel has yet to be preached. So perhaps she and Andronicus weren't apostles in the same way with the authority as the other 12, but they were probably apostles in the same way that Barnabas was an apostle, Acts 14, 14. James was an apostle, Galatians 1, 19. And Epaphroditus was an apostle, Ephesians 2, 25. All I want you to see just in these samples is that as the New Testament unfolds, it's interesting to see how women are occasionally recognized by name as servant leaders of Jesus. It's just context for you in scripture. And I think the context is helpful to remember as you go into these two passages I'm going to walk through with you. These two passages are the passages that are prohibitive of women speaking to the gathered church in these two places that Paul wrote. The first is 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul is giving some instruction for how believers are to operate when they come together for worship. Let's pick up in verse 26. Paul's writing, What shall we say then, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each one of you has a hymn or word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation? Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Stop right there. Part of the, Corinth was an interesting place to go to church because everybody came with something to give at worship. That's why he's giving them instructions for order. You know, I, you grew up reading these. You probably think, yeah, everything needs to be done in decently in order. We need an order, an agenda for worship and make sure we follow it. Listen, there's not a lot of danger of there being chaos breaking out in most American churches. Why? Because not many of us come with something dynamic to give from the Spirit. We come to receive, right? We come to be filled, We come to be edified. There's a place absolutely for coming to receive, to be filled, to be edified. But there is also a place for coming. God, give me something to give someone else today. And part of the reason, everybody came with something to give. And so everybody wanted to contribute a word or something when they gathered together. So Paul's like, hey, everybody's got something to give. By the way, that's a great problem to have. Everybody's got something to share. So he says, Everything must be done so the church may be built up. Let's let's go about this in a way that's edifying to everyone. Jump down to verse 31. For you can all prophesy. Says all. He starts out by saying brothers and sisters. Then he comes down and says verse, for you can all prophesy. In turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged, the spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. What he's saying is, hey, you can't claim, oh, God's spirit got a hold of me, and I just blurted it out. No, that gives you no permission to be a bull in a china closet. He says, hey, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the control of the prophet. You still need to be thinking about what is edifying in this context. And then he goes on to say, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Then he says this, women 
should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Some of you are reading that for the very first time. You're like, what? Now, this is one of the passages that some reference as the reason for why a woman shouldn't be given the opportunity to speak or preach in the gathered church, to testify even in the gathered church. And the chances are, at least some of us have a reflex to this, from a wince to a gag to frustration. Why? Well, there's a couple reasons. One is the culture we live in today. We live in a time in which we see women speaking and leading all over society governors and chief executive officers and a vice president and and they run for president. And so this just, we live in this culture and we can't believe we're reading this. So that's, that's one thing that makes some of us wince. But I would say there's a better reason to wince. There's a better reason to go, say what? And it's because of what you read also about women in the rest of scripture. It's because of what you read also about women in Acts. It's because even what you read in this same passage in context, the opening verse, 1 Corinthians 14 and 26, he addresses them, 1 Corinthians 14 and 26, brothers and sisters, he's talking to them all. Then down to verse 31, you can all prophesy in turn so that you can be instructed and encouraged. That's how, that's the passage, that's in this passage too. Then look how the passage ends. Jump down to verse 39. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. Do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and an orderly way. Note that Paul says brothers and sisters, beginning and end, and twice he connects both of them to prophesying at the beginning and the end of the passage. Here's what I want you to see. So the command Paul's, the command Paul gives to be silent, for women to be silent in the middle of the passage, wasn't intended to silence women completely from speaking prophetically to the church. We have to read it in context. Begins and ends, brothers and sisters. You can all prophesy. Brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. Begins and ends, he issues the admonition in the middle of it for women to be silent. I'll get to that more in just a second, what he's doing. Here's one more thing to factor in. Three chapters earlier, if you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 through 16, Paul gives some instructions about what women were to wear when prophesying and, pay pub, prophesying and praying in the public assembly to show that they believed they were under authority in the culture they were in. So he gives them instructions in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that when they pray and prophesy, that they are, they, are, they are to have a covering over them that communicated were under authority in this particular culture. So if he gives instructions for how to properly prophesy to the gathered church, And then he says in 1 Corinthians 14, twice, brothers and sisters, you can all prophesy. Brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. Paul fully expects and desires for women to be functioning prophetically, publicly speaking to the gathered church. So then what is Paul talking about when he speaks of women being silent in the churches? Is he contradicting himself? Did he lose his mind? Did somebody else insert this in later? I think we should get some insight. Look at verse 35. He says, after telling women to be silent in the churches, he says, if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home. Uh, It's interesting, uh, in the the original language of of Corinthians, uh, that word inquire could also be interpreted as interrogate. What Paul is saying, remember, he's giving instructions for how to have an orderly assembly because everybody is coming together with something to give, with something to say. He's been talking to them about how to prophesy in an orderly way. And it's likely there were women 
interrupting the speakers and asking questions. Here's what you need to know about the setup. In the first century, men and women sat apart from each other in the Jewish synagogue, but also in Greco-Roman culture in gatherings like this. Corinth is made up of, yes, Jewish believers and Gentile believers. It's likely in a large home, there were men and women that sitting apart from one another. Men sat together and women sat together. Okay. So a woman couldn't lean over and ask her husband a question at the moment. Why would they ask a question? Because Paul told them earlier, hey, when you're sharing prophetic words, weigh what each person is saying. Ponder it, you know. But apparently what's happening is that there are women that are incessantly asking questions that keep interrupting. Maybe they're sitting together, yes, as a group, they're not able to ask their husbands. Paul's like, hey, wait till you get home to ask your questions. So he calls for silence in this regard so that people can prophesy one by one without being interrupted by questions. That's possibly what's going on, and it's going on not just in one church, but in many. Why else is it going on? I'll get to that in a second when I get to the next passage. But what I want you to see simply is that the command for women to be silent doesn't mean that they can't speak or prophesy words from the Lord when the church is gathered, because in this very same chapter and elsewhere in the letter, he affirms women prophesying. We're just doing a little Bible study right now. I'll go back to chicken soup for the soul next week if you want me to or something like that. But we're just doing a little Bible study right now. Let me take you to the second passage. This is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Here, the Apostle Paul's talking to Timothy about some things going on with their worship gatherings in Ephesus. He says this, A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue with faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, you ought to be going, what? There's a lot here. It's interesting that last verse, women will be saved through childbearing, just as an illustration. Suppose I were to say right now that a woman being saved is dependent upon her having a child. Suppose that was the altar call every weekend at the end. I just want to remind you that salvation is possible in the name of Jesus for everyone, but if you're a female, you're also required to have a child if you're going to be saved. I wouldn't get off this platform before there would be a line of you saying, I think you might need to correct that. And you would be right. And I would tell you, but the Bible says clearly Women will be saved through childbearing. The Bible says clearly. A verse in the Bible says clearly. Absolutely. But any individual verse you read in the Bible has to be read in light of the greater witness of Scripture around it as well. And you would rightly pull me aside and you would say, there's so much in Scripture that tells us that salvation is found in the name of Jesus alone. Amen? You'd probably quote Acts 4.12, you know, because you, you probably know that verse. And you would, you'd tell me that. You'd tell me other verses. And you'd be exactly right to do that. Well, in the same way, we have to read what else Paul says about women here in light of what the rest of Scripture says. Because there are occasional examples of women in Scripture in positions of leadership of men and women who prophesied and taught men and women. An example would be the prophet and judge Deborah who led all of Israel in Judges chapter 5. The prophet Huldah who King Josiah consulted in 2 Kings 22, 2 Chronicles 34. You can go back and read these stories. All this is in the sermon notes on the app. In fact, it's interesting. Huldah is the one that Josiah consulted for direction from the Lord when it came to celebrating the Passover after reading about it in the law. 
Huldah is the one that Josiah consulted for direction from the Lord. And Josiah consulted her instead of, listen to these prophets, Jeremiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, or Zephaniah. All four of those cats have books of the Bible named after them in the Old Testament. But Josiah goes to Huldah. Micah chapter six and verse four, we find God recognizing Moses' sister Miriam as one of three leaders the Lord sent to lead his people, where the Lord said to his people, I sent Moses to lead you and also Aaron and Miriam. You say, Chris, why are you pointing this out? Because you have to take the larger context of scripture into account when seeking to process any one verse. Having said that, what do you do with this passage in 1 Timothy? Let's just put up the passage again. I want you to look at it right here on the screen. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to be able to see it as we walk through it. First of all, Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. There's a difference between assuming authority and being granted authority. The reason I'm up here is not because I've assumed authority. The reason I'm up here is because I've been granted authority by the body of elders of the branch church. Any person who stands up here, any person who leads in in other ministries, you can for sure know they're up there and have been granted authority by the branch church. And on occasion, when a woman has stood here to testify or to share from the word, she was granted authority. She did not assume that authority any more than I've ever assumed that authority. He doesn't permit the assuming of authority. You say, what's going on there then in Ephesus that you have women doing this? It's likely there were women who were being disruptive and assuming authority in that context. Why? Because Ephesus was the home of the temple of Artemis and its worship cult involved sex with temple prostitutes and priests and all of the priests were women because Artemis is a goddess. A woman, she's female, female goddess. And the religion preached the power of women over men as illustrated by man's need for a woman sexually. So all the priests were female in Artemis. Ephesus is the epicenter for this. But but the cult of Artemis is a powerful cult felt even in Corinth, which which involves a letter I just took you through. At the temple of Artemis, women ruled the show and kept men in their place. Now think about this. You had women coming to faith in Christ in Ephesus that are influenced by this culture. In fact, Paul tells Timothy earlier in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or devote themselves to myths. Why does Paul say that? Because what's probably happening is some of these myths that are beginning to make their way into the church have to do with the cult of Artemis in Ephesus and its message of women's power through their sexuality. By the way, This is probably some of the background behind some of the comments that Paul makes in 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, which lead up to our section, where he makes comments about women should be dressing modestly and not focusing too much on their hair or jewelry or expensive clothes. Why does he say that? Probably because that's all the externals in that culture that can play a part in garnering attention from men. Some of these people may have been women who were recently converted and bringing some myths and false ideas with them out of a culture of secular empowerment. Like I've said before, you can take someone out of the world, but it takes a while for the world to be taken out of them. Now here's the deal. Jesus was one who dignified and honored women. Absolutely. But Jesus is way different from Artemis. And they needed to get to know him. Just because a woman or a man was a new Christ follower, this didn't need, this didn't necessarily mean they needed to automatically assume authority in the new temple. (laughs) They may have come out of a cult or a culture where they had a sense of power and esteem, where their giftedness was respected. 
and people listened to them, but that didn't mean they needed to step into this culture because it's important for every disciple to seek to understand before they're seek to being understood by others. So they need to spend time learning quietly. And for good measure, Paul brings in the creation story to remind them there's nothing holier about women than men. And then he brings up Eve as the one who got the ball rolling with sin in the garden. And before any men go, yeah, that's right. (laughs) Remember the greater biblical context. In Romans chapter five, Paul blames Adam for the problem in the garden and never brings up Eve. Why does he bring up Adam in Romans chapter five? And he bring up Eve in 1 Timothy chapter two because he's addressing different problems in different churches. Now this is my best attempt in a short amount of time to make sense of Paul's admonitions for women to be silent in 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2 while the rest of scripture has mentions of women prophesying and leading. The reality is well-intentioned people have often misapplied 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy chapter 2. You can be well-intentioned and have misapplications. I do it too. Absolutely. We all see in part, we all know in part. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's why it's important that you take a page from the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 and diligently search the scriptures to see if what the speaker was saying was true like they did with the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17. Anytime you sort through a matter like this, I can identify with what Peter said about Paul's writings. I think it's funny when you read through the Bible, you'll see the apostles kind of, they'll they'll have their own little flavor at times. You know, like, like Mark, when he talks about the woman suffering with an issue of blood, He says she suffered at the hands of many physicians. When Luke tells that same story, he just says she suffered and spent a lot of money, but no one could heal her. Luke won't say she suffered at the hands of many physicians. Do you know why? Because Luke's a doctor. (laughs) And he's not going to take a shot at his own vacation, vocation. But Mark, Mark will just leave the doctors hanging out there. It's interesting to see what Peter has to say about Paul in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. Watch this. Watch what Peter says about Paul. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Can I get an amen to that? which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do their other scriptures to their own destruction. It makes me feel so much better that one apostle says to another, man, his letters have some things that are hard to understand. Maybe that's why Paul himself told Timothy later in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, but who correctly handles the word of truth. If there's a correct way of handling the word of truth, there's an incorrect way of handling the word of truth. And listen, every preacher and teacher, because they're human, has times where they incorrectly handle the word of truth. I want you to hear me very clearly. I'm just talking about this particular matter right here And how some passages get taken out of context and are misapplied. Why do I choose to bring this up? Because I've been asked questions about these passages through the years when the subject of gender comes up. I've been asked questions by people who love the scriptures. They love the word of God. And they're trying to make sense of what they read. I've been asked questions by others who love people who are raising daughters with gifts 
and strength. So I don't know what that is. I've got three sons at home. I don't have any girls. I've been asked questions by people who said, help me make sense of this. I read this here and read this there. And by the way, I just want you to know with all my heart, it was my desire to try and answer these questions as best I can. And I also hope it gives you a measure of understanding as to why our leadership believes it's not a violation of the will of God for sisters to stand up before us and declare the word of God. In fact, I would even go on to say, we are for the worse if we don't get to hear from our sisters in all kinds of contexts. Let everything be done for the building up of the church, as Paul said, and this is for the building up of the church because when God created human beings in his image, he created them male and female. Genesis 1, 27 and 28, it takes the male and the female to fully convey the image of God. I think of the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 11 and 12, when talking about matters of worship in the church, and he says this, nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. We have some marvelous sisters among us who walk with Jesus. They're students of the word whom God has gifted to communicate. For the record, not a one have ever asked me to preach something like this. (laughs) This is after being your pastor for 23 years and wanting to address a question I've often been asked about this. And I also believe there are little girls and young teens among us who are gifted in such ways as well. Jesus, the word, came into the world through a woman named Mary. And he still delivered through women today. And speaking of Jesus, that is exactly where I want to point you. Especially on days when I'm addressing questions like these. Since I mentioned Acts 2 and the Spirit being poured out on men and women and they shall prophesy, by the way, basically, the Spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. If you are telling somebody about Jesus, you are prophesying, Revelation 19 and 10. It's important to see where that passage ends up in Acts chapter 2. You get to the end of that passage that Peter's quoting from Joel and you read this, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what it's all unto, that everyone will call on the name of the Lord for salvation. All of us have people in our lives, men and women, who the Lord has moved through to point us to Jesus. Amen? And so as we take communion together, I wanna invite you to center your heart on that. I wanna encourage you to thank the one who saved us through laying down his life for us. But while you're at it, I wanna encourage you to be thankful for the people that he's been delivered through into your lives. Men and women, for some of you, it was your son and daughter, your brother and sister. For some of you, it was an employer or a coworker. For some of you, it was a good friend or a workout buddy. I wanna encourage you to give thanks for the one who the Lord moved through to help you call on the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your presence in this place. And we pray for the ministry of your Holy Spirit to give us further revelation into these matters of which we've spoken, Lord. And Father, I I pray that anything I said that is not fully true to who you are as revealed in scripture, as confirmed by your spirit, I pray that that would fall to the ground in many respects if it contradicts who you are in any way that I've spoken out of my own ignorance, Lord. But I pray that which I've said that is true to who you are revealed in scripture, testified to by Jesus, confirmed by your spirit, I pray it would stick and it would bear fruit a hundredfold, God, Lord a hundredfold. Lord, we thank you for the bread and the cup. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in our lives through whom you've delivered the testimony of Jesus. And Jesus, we are so grateful 
for your blood, Lord, that makes it possible for our sins to be forgiven, for us to have fresh starts and new beginnings. And in Jesus' name, we take it this, amen. Amen. Because there is no one else for me. None but Jesus. Crucify to set me free. Now I live to bring him praise. There is no
Thank you.